Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction. So today I'll be talking about optimal algorithms for learning quantum phase states. Um, at the very beginning of the talk, I'll kind of motivate what I mean by quantum phase states and later on what I mean by optimality. Um, this is joint work with uh, Srinivasan, Sergey Bravi, and Ted Yoder, all of whom are at IBM Quantum. So just let's get started. Uh, so the motivation mainly comes from just quantum state tomography, and here I'm considering the conventional model where we have access to multiple copies of some unknown quantum state row, and the goal is to learn and, and estimate row hat by performing measurements on these copies of this unknown quantum state, such that the distance between whatever you learn, row hat, and row will be small under some distance metric. For instance, it might be infidelity. Now, this has natural applications, for instance, in broader learning to us, such as calibration, circuit verification, or quantum sensing. But what makes this kind of task very difficult is it's widely known that the sample complexity or the number of copies that you actually need to measure grows exponentially with the number of qubits. So that kind of begs the question, are there classes of n qubit quantum states that can be learned efficiently, perhaps in sample complexity that goes as polynomial of n? Now we know some examples, for instance, uh, stabilizer states. So these are just states produced by Clifford circuits on the all zero state, as well as matrix product states and high temperature Gibbs states. And it was shown um, kind of recently in the last one month or so that even states from Clifford circuits, along with some logarithmic number of T gates, can be learned efficiently. And now we're going to kind of look at some other class of uh, quantum states, which we'll call phase states, that could perhaps be learned efficiently. And I'll kind of motivate this by looking at a subclass of stabilizer states called graph states. Now, the reason why graph states are kind of cool is that they have a very compact description on a graph, G. So here I'm just denoting hmm, if this pointer works. Um, the different vertices as the different qubits, all initialized in this case to the plus state. And the different edges uh, that you see correspond to any two qubit operators that will be applied in the future. So for instance, if these were control Z operators, this would be kind of the resulting state. Um, this kind of doesn't reveal any kind of phase description about these states, so I'll just look at the corresponding circuit to begin with. So here I'm considering a five qubit circuit with all of them initially in the all zero state, followed by a layer of Hadamards, and I'm placing control Z gates wherever there was an edge on the left-hand side in the graph. So if I were to do a, like a rundown of this circuit, so initially I have an all zero state, apply the Hadamards, I get essentially uniform superposition of all the five bit uh, binary strings. And up ahead in the circuit, I have a bunch of control Z gates. So just to note down the action of a control Z on a um, kind of ket X, it just imparts a phase of minus one power x i x j, depending on the qubit i and j that the control z gate was acting on. So now if I were to, just considering all these control z gates that you see in the circuit, then the resulting state that I would get, now again it's a uniform superposition, but now I have these amplitudes with like minus one power some phase information, where in the phase I have a bunch of degree two monomial terms on their one quadratic, and each of them, for instance, x1, x2, uh, corresponds to a particular gate. In this case, control Z gate being applied to qubits one and two. So it's quadratic, and there is some kind of monomial to gate correspondence. Um, moreover, these graph states turn out to be, can be learned very efficiently. Um, I'll just work with a bit more, instead of working with the example that we had before, I'll kind of generalize uh, to n qubit graph states. So here we have now, in place of the previous phase information of just minus one power f of x, where f of x is now x transpose ax, so here's the adjacency matrix of the graph. And these were shown back um, by Rottler in 2009, and as well as Montanaro more recently, that these can be learned efficiently through the procedure called Bell sampling. And the idea is that you take two copies of the quantum state. Um, so on the first copy and the second copy, you then apply a ladder of C-naughts. So you have a C-naught acting with the control in the first qubit of the first copy, and the target being the first qubit of the second copy, and so on. Um, followed by a layer of Hadamards on the first register. And if finally, if you were to measure on both registers, what you get as a result is on the second register, you get a uniformly random n-bit binary string, suppose z. And on the first register, you'll get essentially a derivative of f of x, and now in the direction z. And using these random samples, you can show that you can learn the graph states in order of n samples. And what you're really doing is just learning the stabilizers of this stabilizer state. So now this is an example of a classically simulable state uh, that can be learned efficiently. We all know that Clifford circuits can be simulated classically. So can we learn states that are, are 
perhaps not hard, they hard to assimilate classically, but can be now learned efficiently. So I'll just take the previous example that we had before on the five qubit circuit, and now I'll introduce a Z gate on the second qubit and a control control Z gate on the second and third fourth qubits. Now, just to, if I wanted to do a rundown of the circuit, just note downing the action of Z, if I consider the ZI acting on cat X, just impart some phase information of now minus one power XI, similar action of control control Z imparts a phase information of minus one power some cubic middle meal term. And the resulting state um, is very similar to the state that we had before, but now in the phase information, I get these extra monomials of a degree one monomial of X2 and X2, X3, X4 corresponding to the control control Z gate that we had introduced. So now the phase information corresponds to a cubic Boolean polynomial. There is still a monomial to gate correspondence. And the reason I kind of repeat this is that learning these states will kind of imply learning these circuits efficiently because of this monomial to gate correspondence. But to begin with, why are we even interested in such circuits? It turns out these are subclass of IQP circuits where we have a layer of Hadamards in the very beginning followed by internal gates that are either Z, control Z, or control, control Z. And these were shown to be hard to simulate classically by Bremner in 2011. So can we learn these states perhaps efficiently? And even better, can we learn states that are produced by circuits where now the internal gates can be control Zs with controls up to d minus one qubits over uh, d qubits. So then the resulting kind of binary quantum phase state we have um, can again be written as some superposition over all these binary strings get x with an amplitude of minus one per f of x where f is now degree d Boolean polynomial. So here I'm writing down the F2 expression of the degree D uh, Boolean polynomial, where each of the monomial terms will have a corresponding capital J subset of n qubits corresponding to them, followed by a coefficient alpha J, which either is zero or one, because we're just working with the finite field F2. We saw some instances. For D equal two, we get graph states. D equal to three, we get a subclass of IQP states. And for very high degrees, um, we actually will end up with pseudorandom states. So kind of the results that we have regarding this is that um, for degree one, it was already shown by Bernstein and Vazirani that these can be learned in order of one uh, shots. Similarly, we saw that Montanaro and Rothler showed that F2 degree D2 can be learned efficiently. What we were able to show is that in the case of degree D uh, greater than two, we can learn these in order of n power D shots samples if we have access to separable measurements. And if we have access to entangled measurements, we can do a bit better and get them at order of n power D minus one samples. We have also some results about generalized quantum phase states that I won't get into here, but these are essentially states produced by the diagonal unitaries of the Clifford hierarchy. So if you're working in the D at the level of the Clifford hierarchy, then um, you need just order of n power D shots to learn these. So, but today I'll just concentrate on the case of the binary quantum phase states. And in the very beginning, just because we saw the random sample case and ability to learn from those random samples in the case of stabilizer states, in the very beginning, I'll just think of trying to learn these binary phase states from random samples. And think of actually a different picture, but the case of classical learning of Boolean functions. And there, the learning model is that you have access to random samples of x comma f of x, so where x is now some n-bit binary string. And the way you go about learning f is that, in the very beginning, assume that you have access to m such random samples. So here I'm denoting the different sample realizations by just index k. What you do is, in the very beginning, you just set up a very large linear system of equations. So on the left-hand side, I have this very large matrix where each of the columns corresponds to the different monomial terms that you might see in a degree D Boolean polynomial. So you might see just a constant factor followed by degree D1 uh, monomials such as X1, X2. You might see degree two monomials such as X1, X2, all the way up to degree D monomials. So the number of such monomials that you have, at the, for degree k, you have like n choose k of these number of monomials. So if you wanted to look interested in degree d Boolean, Boolean polynomial, you're going to look at monomials from k equal to zero up to d. And there's like order of n power d such uh, monomials. And you can show easily, um, for instance, a textbook, famous textbook by O'Donnell shows that you need order of n power d such random samples to learn degree d Boolean polynomials. So, can we get access to such random samples to learn quantum phase states? And it turns out it's very hard to get access to random samples of x comma f of x in the case of a quantum state, but maybe we can do something very similar to what the stabilizing um, learning approach does, where we have access to random samples of a derivative information and some direction. It turns out this does not work for d greater than two, and the main reason is that you have now here two power n random directions, and it's 
get any two directions to match at the same time becomes exponentially unlikely. So this doesn't unfortunately work. Uh, but I'll show you that there is actually a routine where you can get access to some particular random samples of this nature. And these are turn out to be just separable measurements. So you just look at um, different copies of quantum state and each phase state you can measure uh, separately from others. So, and this routine we'll call as random partial derivative sampling and it'll be clear why we call this routine in such a way. So let's assume we have some unknown quantum phase state and I'm denoting each of the qubits here by just these blue dots. And what we're gonna do is in the very beginning measure all of the qubits but the kth qubit in the Z basis. So then the resulting um, kind of output is a uniformly random string of size n minus one. If we were to look at the post-measurement quantum state of this, this actually corresponds to now a superposition of ket zero and ket one, where you, on the ket zero you have a magnitude of minus one power f of zero y. So f of zero y here is the concatenated vector. And for a ket one you have minus one power f of one y. And this so happens that it, this is, corresponds to the plus state, f of zero y is equal to f of one y, and the minus state otherwise. So what we can do for the kth qubit is just measure it in the x basis. And then we actually end up with a kth partial derivative of the function evaluated y. So in the RPDS procedure, it's kind of very simple. All you do is measure the quantum phase state, all of the qubits in the z basis, except for the kth qubit, which we'll measure in the x basis. And now you get access to random examples of n minus one bit binary strings y, followed by a kth partial derivative of the function evaluated y. And this will actually turn out to help us in learning the function f because you can write down the function f of x as a function g of y that just depends on you know, all the variables involved in um, y, so except for the xk, plus xk times the kth partial derivative. So what we're gonna do is just learn all these kth partial derivatives to learn f of x. So if we wanted to just do a sample complexity analysis of this, what we can do is assume now that we have access to samples of y comma dk f of y from RPDS, and then the goal becomes to, what are the number of samples required to determine this function, this kth partial derivative of f of y? So here now we're just summing over subsets of um, the n variables of size d minus one, because originally we had a degree d Boolean polynomial, but after I take a partial derivative, now I'm left with just d minus one degree, and we look at subsets of all the n qubits except for the kth qubit, which doesn't show up here. So as in the case of the classical learning of Boolean functions, we can actually set up a linear system of equations here again. So on the left-hand side, you would have all the monomial evaluations followed by the solution vector beta, which is now equal to these partial derivative function evaluations. If you were to look at the number of monomial terms that you have here, this actually goes as order of n power d minus one. Now it turns out if for this uh, particular linear system, there's at least one solution, but we need to kind of collect enough number of samples to rule out two solutions. And what we can do is like realize that a second solution would mean a solution to the homogeneous equation, meaning that there is a polynomial that is zero for all of these realizations yj. And luckily for us, the widely known in polynomial identity testing, that if you have a multilinear polynomial p and you have a uniformly random choice of x um, and bit binary string, then the probability of p of x being equal to zero is one minus one over two power d. And using this, you can show that the number of copies that you need it goes as order of n power d minus one to learn the kth partial derivative of f. And what you do to learn f is just repeat this for all the n different uh, directions. So overall you have a sample complexity of order of n power d copies. Um, but this was the case for separable measurements and uh, what I do not show you is that we also have a lower bound that says with several measurements this is kind of the best you can do. But perhaps you can do better with access to entangled measurements. So now what I'm gonna allow for is that I'm gonna measure all the copies perhaps together, so a joint measurement. And the very beginning, I'm gonna start looking at pretty good measurements, which is very common in quantum state discrimination, where the goal is to identify a state and pull from some ensemble. So here the different ensemble members are some rho i, and the probability of them being picked up is uh, some pi. And here the POVM elements uh, look somewhat of this form. Uh, most importantly, you get this uh, square root inverse square root of sigma, which happens to be just this weighed mixture of all of the ensemble members. But what's kind of important to us is kind of the guarantees that you get from pretty good measurements. And the, if I, here I'm just denoting the probability of success as capital P. And what we know is that pretty good measurements, the average probability of success, 
um, isn't as good as the optimal average probability of success if you were to optimize over the, all the m outcome p of m's, but it's at least as good as the square root of that. And if we were to look at the sample complexity of pretty good measurements succeeding on any ensemble for state discrimination, we have this theorem from Heron Winter that says if you know f is the maximum fidelity, then the number of kind of copies that you need to measure to succeed at discrimination goes as order of log of m over delta, where m is the number of ensemble members, delta is your failure probability, divided by log of 1 over f. So f here is the fidelity. Unfortunately, this turns out to be not quite strong enough for us, and you can see this by just looking at our ensemble which is these d different phase states, psi f, where f is now a degree d Boolean function over n variables. And this has exponential of order of n power d um, elements. Uh, unfortunately, some of them are very close together. So you can, like for instance, see like you have a function f of x and g of x is equal to f of x plus some degree d monomial. And if you were to look at the fidelity between these two, these goes, this goes as one minus one over two power d minus one. So with increasing d, kind of exponentially shrink. Um, but fortunately for us, that we can actually combine, uh, we can actually take um, kind of inspiration from a previous uh, average case pretty good measurement theorem to show that if you are able to show that there is a high enough n such that the average fidelity um, is upper bounded by delta, then the pretty good measurements is going to identify a state with very high probability. And we kind of use this above theoretical statement to show that we can learn any quantum phase state using pretty good measurements on order of d times n power d minus one copies of an unknown quantum phase state. And I'll just quickly go over the different steps involved in showing this theorem. So in the first step, we show that the pretty good measurement is actually turns out to be the optimal measurement for state discrimination for quantum phase states. And secondly, the success probability is the same for every f in this ensemble. And third, we'll just analyze the average fidelity in order to use the above the theorem. So for the first step, if we were to look at the different ensemble members, you can realize that you can basically generate them by looking at these diagonal unitaries, where along the diagonal you have these a minus one power f of x for different values of x. If you were to apply this onto the all plus state, you get your binary phase state. These member, this uh, like set of unitaries, fortunately for us, happens to be an abelian group. And it was shown by Edel, Elder and Forney that if you have a set of states that are generated by uh, an abelian group of unitaries, they're so-called geometrically uniform, and for these, pretty good measurements is the optimal um, measurement for state discrimination. So that we can use this result. For analyzing the success probability, it just requires a lot of manipulation. Finally, for average fidelity, you can show that this is, goes as the summation of the bias of the Boolean functions for different members f that you have in this ensemble. And we can upper bound this by a very small constant, provided that n is the number of copies that you need to look at goes as order of n power d minus one. And what we really do here is we kind of use known results on the weight enumerators of the Reed-Muller codes. Um, I'll not go into this, but basically the kind of um, takeaway message is that with several measurements, we had an order of n power d sample complexity, and with entangled measurements, we can do like n better. Question is, can we do even better? Um, unfortunately, from Halevo's theorem, we know that the amount of information that we can extract from measuring any copy uh, kind of limits us that we can require at least n power d minus one copies. So we wouldn't be able to do much better in terms of n. Um, lastly, if you wanted to now use these algorithms for learning quantum states to actually learn these circuits. So here, are, just to recall, um, so the IPQP like circuits kind of look like you have a layer of Hadamards followed by these internal gates, followed by another layer of Hadamards. And if you wanted to recover some uh, binary quantum phase state, you just look at the internal gates applied to all the layer of Hadamards, and then you get uh, the phase state that I've been talking about since then. So the learning algorithm is very simple. It's first, you try to look at the binary phase states correspond to any circuit, and then you use order of n power d queries to learn the function f, um, perhaps using the RPDS procedure. And finally, then you just insert these control Z gates over the different qubits that you see in what, corresponding to whatever monomial term that you have learned in the function of. So if you can learn these IQP-like circuits in order of n power d samples uh, using uh, separate measurements, but you could do better in order of n power d minus one samples using entangled measurements. So overall, I've kind of shown you that there's this subclass of IQP states that are hard to simulate, but now can be easily learned. Um, and we have some results about commenting with generalized phase states, which I haven't really gone into, but there's some more details about that in the paper. 
Um, kind of more applications of these learning algorithms is that this kind of now implies the quantum pseudorandom states, sort of which are kind of popular in quantum cryptography. Um, so these are states that are very easily preparable, but if you give this to a polynomial time algorithm, you can't really distinguish from a hard random state. These must now be a very high polynomial degree. Um, moreover, in measurement-based quantum computing, the resource states there uh, correspond to these hypergraph states, which coincide with the binary phase states. So we have now a protocol for kind of verifying these states. One question that we're very interested in beyond this learning question is the question of testing. So if I was given a, some unknown quantum state, can I very test quickly if it is a phase state of some degree d or far away from any such phase state? And our, you can do testing via learning. So our learning algorithms would imply an order of n power d sample complexity, but this is definitely not optimal. For instance, for d equal to two, which are stabilizer states, we know that you can test these in six copies, whereas our algorithms would give a much worse sample complexity. Um, that kind of concludes my talk. Thank you, and I'll take any questions. Sorry? Um, it just so happens the ones that was considered by Brokersky and um, Irani, they have they talked about they thought about uh, quantum phase states with either kind of the real minus one power something or a complex root of unity. So in that, for just their results, they would have to be hypotonomic degree. This is not true for, in general, any uh, kind of structure of phase states, or like pseudorandom states. Sorry, I, I, I didn't. Yeah. So, um, in the case of uh, like in the IQP circuits, you would have uh, like any type of Z rotation or control Z rotation or uh, kind of different types of rotations. Um, luckily for us, Ashley Montana Arrow um, showed that if you consider just these sub class of IQP circuits then this becomes as hard as finding uh, roots of uh, cubic polynomials with limited resources. Mm -hmm. um, and that shows kind of classical similarity is hard. Uh, so we do still have hardness results for these circuits. Um, but yeah, the, the question of like trying to learn um, IQP circuits with general Z rotations is still open, as far as I know. Thanks. Ooh, I've got a question. Hey, yes, thanks for the talk. Um, so I have a bit of a high-level question about the point you're making at the end that uh, you're, you're showing that there's states that are hard to simulate but easy to learn. Um, so I guess this is a bit confusing to me because um, presumably, well, so if, since the states are easy to learn, presumably you have some sort of good classical description of the states, right? Efficient. But this still implies that even if you have a classical description, these states are like hard to simulate for some reason. So what's the... Wait, um, so, sorry, I didn't get yeah. your question. So, so when you when you when you when you learn these states, you learn them because you have uh, what you learn is, an, uh, is some classical description of the of the state, right? Right. Um, so what I'm understanding is that you have a classical description of a state, but this state is still hard to simulate. Yes. So what's the? I mean, why is there no contradiction here? Well, uh, here we're just trying to learn. It has some kind of structure, right? right. The classical structure in this case is a Boolean function yeah. f yes, that we're just taking advantage of. Uh, but here, simulating uh, means like trying to um, like basically sample from its uh, marginals of the probability right. distribution, right, right. which is which going to be hard, irrespective of even if we you have access to the classical information. And, and of course, you're not, you're not going to be able to do this with your classical description. No, we're not. Right? Okay, yeah. yeah. That's, uh, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. 
All right, uh, let me check the time. So I think we have time for one more question, if anybody wants. Oh, we got one more. Yeah, thanks for the very nice talk. Um, Thank you. Uh, how about uh, generalizations? Like, could one consider something like more yeah, complex phases? Like yes. So other uh, roots of unity. Uh, that's a great question. So it so happens in the case of the degree d generalized phase states, you get complex uh, roots of unity or complex phases, and you can learn those uh, efficiently, as long as you're within this diagonal unitary levels. Um, because there's some kind of group structure that you can basically take advantage of. Um, there are other cases where you have complex phases that we are not able to tackle yet. Does this also uh, contain uh, Q-dit systems? Like with These can be generalized to prime Q-dits. OK, yeah. That's yeah. it. Thanks. All right. In that case, we might uh, thank the speaker again. Thanks.